parlez le français. Hi, everybody. Mais oui, je parle français. Mais oui, we are not going to do this conversation in French. Spanish, Portuguese, that would be okay. Welcome to Game Changers Chat in support of my book, Game Changers Guide to Radical Success. I started these conversations because I realized who cares about a LinkedIn profile? Who cares about a resume? We want to know how people navigate their life in such a way that um, helps them be true and means that success is more than checking boxes or hitting a metric, but, but that there's something of being true to yourself that happens um, along the way and hopefully all along the way. Some of us have to do it through a rude awakening. So we're going to dive into Steve. Before we do that, I've got some technical stuff for you guys. Okay. Um, we are simulcasting over two places on Facebook, one place on YouTube and one place on LinkedIn. And so that means there's various chat feeds uh, coming in. And if we don't see your question, it's not because it's not a good question and it's not because we're mean. It's because there's a glitch in the Techniverse, which happens, right? And so, um, but I promise you that both Steve and I will circle back and look for questions and get back to you in the meantime. So um, join me in welcoming Steve Kravick. Hey folks. <laughs> hey folks. Um, so Steve, one of the ways I love to start these conversations is by asking people what they loved most as a little one, oh, as a young child. What was your favorite thing to do? What gave you the most happiness? Hmm. I don't go back. I don't go back there too often. Well, um, surprises, Steve. So you better be on your toes. Oh gosh. Oh god. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, that's when you start speaking in French again, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, I think as a kid, uh, stuff that I gravitated towards was, uh, well, as a kid, like there was just, <laughs> there was no spare time, right? I had a mother who was like, okay, well, you're doing this this day and this this day and this this oh. day. And then summer would come and it's like, well, you're going to go to uh, day camp on these days and then you'll be going here on these days. So there was never really much time to kind of uh, lay out your, your own life. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as it were, everything was kind of metric, <laughs> metric out for you. Wow. Uh, I think uh, some of my fondest memories of uh, childhood um, would just be connecting with, um, with neighbors, making new friends, learning how to socialize. Mm -hmm. Um, I can also remember when I was like a teenager, my father uh, ran his own business. So I would sometimes work part time for him. And I can remember enjoying that a lot, uh, understanding, you know, how seeing how money was handled, how transactions were handled, how mm -hmm. business was discussed, like in the real world when you're only, you know, 13 or 14. Hmm. Uh, to kind wow. of see how, That's cool. how, how things are done. And, um, Sort of on what on on what on what level things are done and what actually gets said behind people's backs and mm. just how the, how the world really works. You're always kind of showing how the world really works. At a so really you learned age. the 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 art of uh, connectivity, right? Of really uh, connecting with people, and you learned um, the dance between how we show up and maybe how we really feel about. I think, yeah, I, I mean, anybody that says that they don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they're probably not very successful <laughs> or they're I'm lying. Not very honest, right? <laughs> or they're lying. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, so yeah. you have been incredibly um, successful and you've been incredibly successful in um, a field that is notoriously challenging and difficult. And I don't want to send people to read your resume because I just made fun of that. But what do you tell people? Like, what was the arc of your career or what has been the arc? Cause you're not dead yet. So far as I can tell. Um, I, I think really if there's anything consistent to it, it's sort of what we just touched on and that's relationships. Yeah. Building and maintaining relationships and um, knowing that, um, that those that those are investments, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, and investments in others uh, that you trust. It's investment an investment in yourself. Yeah. And uh, we cycle through um, social groups and business groups in our in our lives, uh, but um, we always come back to those very important relationships. They stand the test of time. We know we can go back and ask you know somebody from 25 years ago you know what happened then or what do you really think about what's happening right now and you know you're going to get the the, the god's honest truth mm -hmm. you know? thank god um, right people who take you behind the mask and tell you what they actually think yeah uh, i mean also i think it helps to be able to read people a little bit mm -hmm. and uh and listen listen to what other people uh, um, what, what what their wants, what their what their needs are. Mm -hmm. I can remember uh, a few years back, and I was working with a, I was working as an engineer under a, another producer, mm -hmm. as a recording engineer under another producer, and he was talking about uh, talking with a band, and he said he says, well, I talked to the band and I asked them, what kind of record do you want to make? And I thought that's a very good way of approaching it. Yeah. You know, uh, you're putting the customer in the driver's seat. You're allow, allowing them to express themselves and hopefully complete the idea that's going to give you the directive to go on your way and do what they want you to do. Yeah. Um, well, and it really flies in the face of what we see um, in movies where the band is being ramshackled through a system and, you know, programmed for corporate pop rock whatever but these people may not know who you've worked with or how you ended up in music so so can you give them just a thumbnail sketch of of how you got into it and some of the bands you've worked with along the way um i think that i mean the majority of all the work that i've done has been um in, in music and production has been work that I found myself, that I got myself. I never worked through a, an agency or a manager. Uh, it was really all about um, going from one project to the next project, from one project to the next project, um, getting something done, getting some press for that, um, using that, getting out there talking to other people. Hey, I just did this. I, it might be a good fit for me to work with you guys. Um, and then doing the little things to follow up, you mm -hmm. know, going to see bands live, sitting down and talking to people, finding out, you know, what it, what is it that they're looking for? Yeah. And so bit by bit, just building all these, uh, these sort of relationships and these jobs one, one at a time, it's sort of somehow turned into like a 30 year career. Well, that might have been a courageous choice though. I mean, what, what year did you first start to get into the music business? And I'm not asking you to date yourself, but, but I'm just curious. I mean, what, what was hot, what was happening then? Um, I think that when I first realized, okay, this is, um, interesting enough and to, to hold my attention, mm -hmm. um, but also seems to be at the core of what I like. Um, I was probably in my early 20s, 2021. And um, I was actually in university at the time doing just entry level fine arts mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, lit, photography, that kind of stuff. And yeah, and um, opportunities started presenting themselves as far as being able to do more work in music. And it seemed that I was being pulled that way. So I basically just dropped school and said, I can come back to this if I, yeah. I want to. My foot's in the door. I've got a, uh, you know, a year and a half in. I said, I'm going to jump in and just see what happens. Hmm. What? And that was sort of where it started, and yeah. it kind of just built along from there. 
what kind of musician were you at that point? Pretty rudimentary one. <laughs> oh my God, you mean you weren't like Segovia at the age of 22? Oh no, no. I mean, we had, uh, you know, I had played in uh, high school punk rock bands, mm -hmm. you know, and never really, uh, you know, properly learned my instrument uh, or, or any of them. <laughs> <laughs> for that matter Not amazing. but uh but um you know plenty of years of application and uh listening and watching other great performers yeah right just watching being in it right yeah. being in it being around it being exposed to it caring That's about it. it paying attention yeah and just like not talking about it just listening listening yeah. listening listening to how business is done listen to how this drummer plays that paradiddle. Listen to how uh, this band sounds as a band. Listen to how this band leader sounds when he's chewing guys out because they're not listening to one another because mm. they're doing a lousy job. God, it's so you know. There's so there's so there's yeah. so 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 many aspects of that, right? Well, it, it's a fascinating thing to me because um, I think a lot of times, especially growing up, we're told to think of something and then go and try to do it. And what you're talking about is a very organic process of being in it, paying mm -hmm. attention to it, loving it. Right. And maybe painful moments and challenges, et cetera, along the way, but you really became of it first. Uh, yeah, I, th I think so. Um, and I think that's good in this business, in the music business. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of pitfalls. Uh, so having um, a true love of what you do uh, is pretty important um, when you have to face some of the things that end up ha happening, you know? Um, and that's not to say it's, uh, you know, all horror stories. There's, there's lots of good in this business and there's a lot of good people in, in this business. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been in it for this amount of time uh, or wouldn't have been in it for this amount of time if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't rewarding, you know? Yeah. Well, so help me understand that. I mean, you chose the indie route. Were there moments where you were approached or tempted to go work for a big shop, a big label? Yeah. there. Um, when I had moved into Los Angeles, the Los Angeles market, yeah. there could have been opportunities then to do other things. Um, and I really felt like the reason I had come here was to make my own mark mm. and the, so that it was going to be um, my thing uh, as it were. And, and the funny thing is, is during the time that I've lived and worked in the city, I've had a couple of business partners mm -hmm. and those relationships just never seem to work. You know, I'm too focused on my thing or my direction. Mm. Um, I think sometimes to, to listen to, you know, partner. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I guess that's something you learn, learn with time, but mm -hmm. not everybody can do that. Right. Some people can partner with other people. Some people just want to go to a job somewhere and pick up a check. Well, were you conscious that you were potentially trading off more job security money um, guarantees. Yeah, uh, I still am. <laughs> yeah, well, I, okay. Yeah, I'm kind of. Yeah. I'm kind of leading the witness here. I mean, <laughs> but, but but look, I mean, that's that's a big thing. I mean, the stakes are really high in music because there are a lot of people who do make a lot of money. Um, how did you decide to stay true to yourself in the face of the temptation? Well. I, I mean, it's just reality too, right? Like starting in the early 2000s, the business began to collapse, you know, yeah. and, and revenue started to collapse uh, where you, you know, get job after job making, producing records for bands and, 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 and create uh, good revenue for doing it, you know, but also like, mind you, working 12 and 14 hours every day, right? Mm -hmm. Like trade-offs, yeah. uh, you know? Um, the, um, I mean, the bottom line is that, 
I feel that I, I, I like, and I knew that, that this was coming, right? I knew that things were kind of getting to a point where you're, are you going to cut and run here? Are you going to stay with this? And I really didn't know any, anything else. Yeah. Right. Making, uh, making records had been my trade for years. Mm -hmm. And so in fact, what I had to do in order to sort of, sort of stay the course was to diversify a bit. How so? And, well, in the, in the sense that um, I took on, I took my record label business and started to focus on that and, and build that. Vinyl was beginning to come back and happen. Uh -huh. So I could see that was a great opportunity. Thank God and, for the ministers, right? Right, right. But it's what, like what's, 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 what's new is, uh, what's old is new again, right? And so, um, you know, I looked at that and I saw opportunity there and I could see that, you know, because I had relationships with folks at the major labels for doing pr from production and that sort of thing, it was easy to walk across the hall to sales and start doing licensing deals with people and mm -hmm. getting, getting records in, into the fold that people wanted to buy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I could see as the, as the production avenue was closing and the engineering avenue was closing that I would have to, you know, diversify if I wanted to stay uh, in, in the business. So yeah, growing the label was, was, a, was a, a big part of that. There's you a craftiness there. Like I saw that you have the rights for the reissues of a lot of big names from, from the eighties, like the, the, the heyday of, right. of roots punk that now sounds like pop half of it. It's crazy how, how our ears have, have, uh, yeah. Have acclimated at the time it was raw. Well, it's still raw, but but um, when you look at that move, right? That was a commercial move. Are you still able to feel passionate about it? Oh, for sure. Um, I think that uh, there's 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 plenty of levels about making records that it's that you can be passionate about. Yeah. And and the making of vinyl records is such a fine art. Um, and in some ways sort of a misunderstood art um, that um, it's a whole rabbit hole in itself. You, you know? And so that's from an engineering tip and a technical standpoint, there's, um, there's lots to learn there, you know, Sounds like you uh, and Wade, the yeah, rabbit from, from, and for, for, for my engineering mind, that's great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, and also it's like, it's sort of revisiting that fascination of being, a kid and um, pulling out record jackets, you know, and looking at the, the artwork and the sleeves and, you know, putting it on, listening to the whole process of, of what rock and roll was then, you know, or what the, the entertainment experience was then. I still have all mine. I've and so mine. it's really nice to go back to that and uh, to be in, in, involved in that. Um, you know, a lot of people are in that vinyl reissue business, so it's yeah. uh, it becomes hard to find uh, good titles to reissue, and you have to kind of go and look and sleuth uh, between the cracks, and that's fun and exciting too. And sometimes you get to meet some folks, or you know, find find some treasures along the way that are that are that are pretty interesting. One thing I read, because um, obviously I do some homework on folks. <laughs> Before they go on here. But one thing I read that I really appreciated was um, all the quotes on your brag sheet were about um, the bands you work with really feeling like you were almost like a mentor or like you really got them and you really helped them be in their fullest expression creatively. And you, right. and, and I thought that was really a beautiful thing because I think most creators want that from someone who's going to help their art come forth and to have that be the resounding compliment. Um, and when I hear that as a kid, that was one of your highest pleasures was really connecting with people. Do you feel like that's all kind of um, full circle? Right? Oh, uh, I, I definitely think so. Um, I think maybe what some of those artists might be referring to is just having um, somebody that can 
uh, act as a teacher uh, now and again and go, yeah, you know, you could try that this way or we could try it this way or this way. Yeah. Um, and um, a few folks have sort of mentioned that uh, over the years that uh, they felt part of the experience was um, educational. Yeah. And so if that's a value that I can carry with me and impart to others, that's pretty important. Yeah. You know? um, and I, of course I'm learning the entire time too, right? Uh, yeah. Whether it be learning about personality or how that person plays their instrument or writes their lyric or, you know, sings their, their, their melody, right? You're, you're there to take all of that in and, and make past judgment, make judgments about, you know, what you feel uh, has strength and what you feel has to be worked on, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're in that, uh, in that uh, rabbit hole, you might be making five, 600 decisions a day about how is this, this going to be and yeah. how is this going to fit? But you're also thinking about how things are going to fit later on. It requires some vision and imagination to, um, to make sure when you get to the end of the road and you've had the guys record all these parts and do all this stuff that you kind of push up the faders and you go, whoa, that sounds like a record. Wow. Instead of like kind of getting there and going, oh boy, <laughs> we, uh, we made a mistake here or, or that yeah. does not fit, you know? You've bridged so many genres, though. Like I saw that you've done uh, gospel, you've done ska, you've got, done punk, indie, pop, Christian rock, right? Um, uh, I think it's all like based in rock and roll and independent rock and roll and punk rock. You know, the bands that I went to go and see when I was a kid, and what they were doing. They were, would have been, I would have been 15 or 16 years old. They would have been at 21, 22, 23 years old, you know, the local musicians, right? Stage what was the best show you saw as a kid? Oh, as a kid. Our first show or most lasting impression show. Ooh. Um, I think uh, two pop into my mind, The Clash. Mm. Um, that was a little, that was like a combat rock tour. So that was like 80, yeah. 83. Mm -hmm. uh, Topper was gone. They had uh, they had uh, Terry Chimes playing drums at that point, but it was good, and it was like it was pretty awesome to see the see the Clash. <laughs> but um, great punk rock shows, man. Some of the in Vancouver where I grew up, the uh, some of the DOA shows. Mm off the chain and they would be touring with the big West coast bands, right? They would be touring with black flag. They would be touring with dead Kennedys. Yeah. So um, those bands were all working their way up down the coast at that time. So you'd get to see them every once in a while, you know, if they could get across the, if they could get across the border into Canada. You know, so I was kind of thinking about the gospel thing, ska, punk, indie, and yeah, it's all based in roots rock, but, but it also struck me that you as a teacher, we're probably learning subtleties in each of these sub genres that may have helped you become more creative. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I had a, I had a really sort of interesting uh, career for a while uh, when I was younger as a, as a live uh, sound engineer. Mm -hmm. And one of the jobs that I would do uh, once a year in that trade was that I would get to mix the Montreal International Jazz Festival. Oh wow! And so you'd play, you'd you know you'd you'd be mixing Miles Davis one night. Oh, you know, and you know maybe like a blues show, John Lee Hooker the next, you know. Oh wow! But you'd see um, great horn sections, you know. You'd gr see great percussion players. You'd see people you know, doing stuff in a band setting that you maybe wouldn't have seen in a punk rock setting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd see how a leader of a three piece horn section would be guiding the other guys with nuance during the set. Mm -hmm. And you'd be learning the entire time because you're, those guys are the best, right? The absolute top of their game. 
guys. It's a free lesson. You just have to pay attention, right? If you're willing to pay attention. Yep. Yeah. And you have some patience. And then so later on in life, when you're talking with horn players, you can address their concerns or you can address what they're uh, saying. You can address, you know, on their level, in their mind, you know, uh, sub the subject of tone or the subject of nuance, the subject of phrasing. Um, and you can communicate with them at a level that they can quickly understand. So you can move on to the next, the next thing. And so having a little language that you can talk with each musician, you know, in the, in the band, uh, is very valuable as well. And it's part of that sort of teaching thing where you've got a, hopefully a little something to impart to everybody, you know? And I like to say, like, the one thing I just like to say to people is like, listen to one another, just listen to one another. And that goes a long way to making a band sound good. You know, when four guys are standing in a room, staring at their feet and kind of not listening to one another and just kind of going through the motions, it never really sounds that good. So what project are you most proud of, of everything hmm. you've done? Hmm. I'm really proud of the, my own record that I finished about a, a, a year ago. I played it. It's awesome. Thanks. Um, that one was a long, long time coming in development and uh, in the back of my mind. And then certain sort of things had to transpire and then you're ready to write, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm happy with the way it came out. I think it stands up and I think it expresses what I want it to express. Mm -hmm. And I think that even though it took me uh, a couple of decades to get to do it, <laughs> that I did it and I did it to the best of my ability. And um, I feel very fortunate that some folks have listened to it. It's gotten some college radio play. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a handful of very cool music journalists have written about the record and, and offered really, really supportive words and praise for it. So say the name of it so that, so that anyone here who wants to look it up. Can find sure. It. Yeah, sure, sure. So it's under, uh, I, I do it. It's done under the name of Stephen Bradley. Bradley is my middle name. So yeah. um, I thought, thought that was a little bit more memorable than Kravak. Your other famous name. My <laughs> other famous name, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, it's under the name Stephen Bradley, uh, and the the LP is called Summer Bliss and Autumn Tears, mm -hmm. and uh, it is available on streaming services. Uh, there's a The singles are on Spotify. The whole LP is on Apple Music, and uh, you can always – folks can always stream it at uh, porterhouserecords.com. There's a there's – a, uh, there's a streaming music player for a bunch of the artists at the website. So folks can go there and stream the music at the site at any time you want for free. I used it. It works. Okay. Before we, we sayonara though, uh, mm -hmm. just because I am really curious. I mean, um, right now is a time of a lot of uh, professional change. And I think that the pandemic um, time alone, time at home, time not alone, surrounded by family, like all these things have a lot of people thinking about what they do with themselves and what they do with their lives. And, or maybe they are young people for whom going to college and having a college experience didn't happen on campus. And so maybe they spent a lot more time online. I mean, um, you've gone the indie route and no doubt there have been some trade-offs. It sounds like you're incredibly creatively satisfied. So I have two parting questions for you and I'll go one at a time. First and foremost, for someone wanting to get into music and just looking at all the stuff, Oh, the labels are dead or no, they're not dead. They control everything or there's only four stations on the planet anymore. They're all controlled by corporate America. Like what would you tell people getting caught in that whirlpool of all the reasons to not get into music? Sounds like a perfect path to fail in music, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that um, it's a tough business, but it's no tougher than any other business. Thank you. It's hard to be a good teacher. It's hard to be uh, a, 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 
uh, a great musician. It's hard to be uh, a great attorney. Yeah. Right. So you really just have to say to yourself, if this is what I want, then I have to start making concrete steps to do it. Yeah. And that's all I did. You know, I just kept pounding the pavement yeah. and somehow turned uh, an idea into a career and was able to sort of shape my life in a way that allowed me to do that. Have I made sacrifices? Certainly. There's lots of things that, um, that I didn't get yeah. this go around. And um, I don't, I'm, I don't have any concerns about that whatsoever. Um, you have to stay true to your heart. You have to be, if you have to believe that uh, you can succeed, you got to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, that's all, that's all I did. And I just kept putting one foot in front of another, right? One foot forward, uh, uh, two foot forward, one foot back. And uh, there's a great quote by Francis Ford Coppola. And he says, no matter what you do, you better love it because it's going to turn into drudgery. Right. Um, but I love the point that you make. I don't know an industry that isn't uh, competitive. I don't know a profession that's not going to ask of you your best. Right. Oh, absolutely. Look at a junior partner going into a law firm. You know, they might be asked to show up at four in the morning to do, to do prep for the first meetings at eight o'clock and everybody else is, you know, the attorneys are gone at, at two and they're there till, you know, nine or 10 at night working. Right. Mm -hmm. But if yeah. you want to make partner, if you want to, if you want to move forward, those are the things that you have to do. Mm -hmm. Just like you want to, um, you know, somehow make it as a record producer. Well, you're going to do some sessions, some recording sessions. It'll be 24 hours long and you don't sleep and you get back up and do it the next day. You just, you just do it, do it, do it, do it. Right. Until, until things kind of start to go your way a little bit, you know, but you make your own luck mm. and you put yourself out there. Things happen. You don't put yourself out there. I used to work with this guy. He used to say, you know, no calls, no sales. Mm. I mean, very on point. It's very succinct. It's very simple, but no calls, no sales. You know, I got to be hustling the, the, the label. You know, I've got to be calling uh, the majors, finding out if there's anything that, you know, is available for license. I've got to be, scouring looking for bands there's 10 other producers that want to work with those bands i've got to go out and see their show and shake hands and make sure that they remember that oh he showed up he cared mm -hmm. you know i have to go the extra step in everything that i do you know mm -hmm. but the uh the but the, re the rewards are there the relationships are there um there's a support network there even as i've gone through a tough year with 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 covid you know Things will, so good things will happen. You know, a, a, a client at the studio said, hey, you know, we can't get up there right now, but uh, because of the situation, but here's a $500 deposit for our next session. Oh, that's great. You know, so, so, there, so there is, there are folks out there that are trying to help and trying to be cognizant of, you know, what we're going through as, as, as creatives, uh, you know, on that side. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's greatly, it's greatly appreciated. So I'm curious, um, because you've been at what you're doing long enough to really have a clear sense of self and a clear sense of scrappy, right, of grit. Um, you've got the creative, you've got the business, you've got the techie, right? You've, you've got all these things and the trade-off, right? Because I think even that person who decides they want to be an attorney, they're they're making huge trade offs as well. But yep. uh, one of the things I'm curious about, and this is my last question, and it's really core to, I think what it means to be fully human is if you define success on your terms, on Steve's terms, what does it mean to be successful? Hmm. Steve? Good question. Um, it's a thing that my dad used to say when he, I'd go to work with him. He'd say, you know, I'm coming in here and I'm thinking to myself, what are we going to do today? Mm. What can I do today with what I have here? Mm. If I get to make that choice, if I get to have that say, wow. Yeah. Pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, that's that, that kind of washes away a lot of the tears, you know, and not getting the house on the hill and not having the three car garage and, 
just the sacrifices you make for uh, yourself and for your art and for your peace of mind. Yeah. For the health of your own, for the health of your own mind. But yeah, that to me is the definition of success. If I can get up and go, what do I want to do today? Do I want to work on the label a little bit? Do I want to jump into the studio and work on that song? Mm -hmm. um, do I want to get on the phone and hustle a business deal? Um, you know, I have the freedom to do those things and I have the freedom to make of my life and direct my life in a way that I see fit. Discretionary. Yeah. That, that really, the discretionary effort. I love it. Yeah. Well, I'm really grateful to you because so much of what you have illustrated through your career um, is what, what I like to call is radical success. <laughs> success where you're being true to yourself, not, not extremists, right? People hear the word radical and they think, Oh my God, that's extremist. No, being true to yourself. Yeah. To yeah. And um, well, that's a bit of a radical concept, isn't it? Like, we're taught from the moment that we're put into, into elementary school, right? You need to be here at this time. You take your coffee break or your recess at this time. It's lunch at this time. Coffee break or recess at this time. They start you early. Yep, they do. And, and, and uh, you know, you have to, 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 to get outside just that sort of socialization. Mm -hmm and get to a point where you realize that, you know, there is a way, there is another way. There is. <laughs> uh, is, <laughs> is, um, is gratifying, but it's, it's not without its, uh, its lumps and uh, it, it scrapes. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, <laughs> yeah. Steve, thank you so much. And it's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed chatting with you and it was all, it was all really good stuff. All your questions made me think. <laughs> well, my job <laughs> one that I love um, for you watching I do these every time I find someone who is uh, compelling and has a story to share our next guest is Earl Bridges it will be next Wednesday he former corporate dude whose heart pulled him into corporate social responsibility and that pulled him straight on over to starting a TV series that got picked up by PBS called The Good Road. Um, it's gonna be awesome to talk to him, so join me. Um, if you like these ideas that Steve has talked about, um, if you like this idea of really defining life on your own terms, whether you wanna make a seven figure salary or whatever the metrics are, um, yeah. pick up my book, uh, Game Changer's Guide. It will help you no matter what kind of lifestyle you wanna support, it will help you be true to yourself along the way. So thank you, Steve, for helping me bring this idea to life. And um, I'm sure there's a, a wedding in a couple months I'm going to see you at anyway. <laughs> gonna have to that. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Great to chat. Take care.